I'm Paul Beckwith and I'm on my Cross Canada tour, climate uh, tour to investigate uh, extreme weather events and uh, you know some regions of Canada that have been negatively impacted by um, severe weather events from abrupt climate change. So if I uh, I'm a bit jumbled in my discussions. It's probably because I uh, was up most of last night, uh, you know, um, in the car driving with um, my friend Lazar. So right now we left Ottawa Sunday morning about uh, 9.30. And uh, here we are uh, Monday morning about uh, eight o'clock or so. We're just north of uh, Lake Superior. Um, of the the city of uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, and uh, we're intending to visit uh, four provinces once we get out of Ontario. Um, this is Highway 11 in the background over here. Once we get out of uh, Ontario into Manitoba, we're going to swing by Winnipeg and then into Saskatchewan and uh, visit the um, residential school site where over 751 unmarked graves lie uh, next to one of the uh, residential schools and then into Regina and then over to um, Saskatchewan and then over to uh, Calgary, Alberta. And then uh, it's likely that there won't be a lot of storms developing over the Great Plains, uh, you know, leading to tornadoes in the next uh, four or five days, probably because the, uh, of the heat dome which uh, you've probably read about and heard about over the western U.S. up into Canada. Incredibly high temperatures, records being set all around because we've got a strong ridge of the jet stream that is just parked over the uh, western coast, uh, the western half of uh, North America. And that jet stream is being, uh, is uh, very strongly ridged and under it is a is the heat dome. So it's a very extremely dry, extremely hot. It's setting temperature records galore. Um, in Can and I think Canada, you know, parts of BC, they reached a record temperature for Canada of 46.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Was, that was the record that was just set. Um, so it's a beautiful, beautiful scenery here. And I'll just uh, walk slowly so you can, it scans in the background. What I mostly want to talk about is the collapse of the building in Florida. Um, this is uh, the Florida. Florida is in trouble from sea level rise, as you know, and a lot of Florida is limestone based. So the limestone dissolves and the base, the uh, geology underneath the buildings and the coastline, etc., is perforated limestone. So it's impossible, for example, to build a seawall to protect parts of the coastline because the water would just percolate through the limestone and bubble up far inland. So that's impossible. And uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, rapid sea level rise around the globe. And the, a lot of the Florida coastline is very low, is very low elevation above sea level. And uh, we're also seeing a lot of subsidence. So there's parts of the beach area where the water, the seawater percolates in and it contaminates the groundwater supplies in Florida and uh, it causes, uh, basically dissolves the limestone and causes more and more perforations and subsidence of the uh, coastline, especially on the beach sides, like the closer you are to the beach, the greater the subsidence. And it appears to be that appears to have been the case of the building that collapsed. An engineering study showed that between 1993 and 1999, the, uh, the building was, was uh, subsiding, sinking downwards about two millimeters per year. And it appears that there was uneven sinking so that the beach side was sinking faster then the side away from the beach and the whole side of the building, uh, as you know, sheared away. Um, also, you know, I'm not sure about the engineering standards for the concrete materials in the building. The building was about 40 
years old, but there were engineering reports saying that, uh, you know, this saying that it was in trouble. So, so this is a huge problem. And, uh, you know, it leads me to think that with the, you know, the coastline of Florida is already experiencing severe um, king tides. Um, and that added on top of the sea level rise, and that added on top of the subsidence of the coastline, and that added on to the perforation of the limestone uh, ge you know, geological base underneath these buildings. And I could see, I can see lots of problems occurring, um, you know, as we move forward. You know, these buildings all need to be tested and perhaps reinforced or you know, just eventually abandoned because, um, you know, with the king tides flooding the streets and flooding the foundations of these buildings, it's just asking for trouble. Also, so the salt water getting in there, it degrades the concrete. And if it hits the rebar, the metal rods in the concrete, which uh, increase the tensile strength of concrete and in the columns uh, supporting the buildings, if those are undercut by erosion of the, uh, by rusting of the rebar, erosion of the rebar and degradation of the concrete, then it's asking for trouble. I mean, engineers are saying that one column in that, one column failing in that type of building can bring down the entire building. So there's gonna be lots of um, reports and lots of studies on this collapse and uh, you know, I think eventually, uh, you know, it is pretty obvious that you can't discount the effects of climate change, induced sea level rise in, in uh, degrading this coastal infrastructure, making it extremely um, expensive and, you know, costly in terms of uh, lives and in terms of, of infrastructure. Um, you know, we're going to eventually have to have a sustained re retreat basically a retreat from coastlines because, um, you know, buildings won't be insured and, uh, you know, the, there, there's obviously a lot of danger. I mean, we need to put sensors in a lot of these buildings to, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that a building could just collapse without a lot of prior warning signs. And I think in the case of this building that collapsed, there were a lot of warning signs, but they were sort of brushed under the rug and kind of ignored or at least not, uh, you know, not treated seriously. So, you know, we're, these are the consequences of abrupt climate change. And, uh, you know, the co coastal regions around the world are in uh, trouble. I mean, so that in Florida, there's not much that can be done. You know, other coastlines, for example, if you go up to the Arctic, a lot of the coastlines are um, collapsing because we're losing Arctic sea ice extremely rapidly. So the wave action, waves are much, much higher because the fetch or the distance <coughs> over the water, open water at, through which uh, the wind blows is, uh, well, the fetch is larger, much, much larger and the winds are stronger and they're blowing over the ocean, they're kicking up a lot more waves and that, those waves are eroding the shoreline. Also the huge warming in the Arctic is sawing out the permafrost and there's lots of permafrost on the coastlines. So we're losing tremendous amounts of the coastlines up in the Arctic. They're just uh, falling into the sea. The, the permafrost is thawing and it's the glue that acts as structural support for these coastlines and they're just falling into the, into the sea and being, uh, you know, washed away. So the, also the thawing permafrost is, uh, you know, reducing the stability that un underlying of the ground, underlying many buildings and many forests and things. So trees start to lean over, they're called drunken forests and uh, buildings uh, can collapse and also there's Increasingly, there's more and more of the sinkhole type events where the methane, uh, you know, methane class rates um, that are under the ground thaw out, the methane is released, the water drains away, and uh, the whole, you get a collapse of, of 
a whole area into a large sinkhole and, they, and sometimes explosions have been reported in these sinkholes um, which blow basically a plug of earth out and then uh, and then it backfills and that in, you know that that process is creating larger and larger sinkholes and we're getting more and more landslides as well um, so you know over other coastlines the you know beach with beaches etc there's more and more erosion as sea level is rising um, and uh, you know if thing if structures have been built on reclaimed land so this is where you have a coastline where you put in all of this rock fill and sand and soil fill and pack it down and then you build buildings on top of it of course those are subsiding um, and uh, you know threatening structures on that type of land so look at Manhattan Island and, and other parts of New York where you know look at parts of any 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 parts any cities that are along the coastline uh, look at areas where the land was reclaimed or filled in on the coastline you know packed together because those areas are very vulnerable to to sea level rise so these are all the severe consequences that we're, that we're facing from abrupt climate change. And, uh, you know, as sea level continues to rise faster and faster, and it will in the near-term future, because when we lose Arctic sea ice and have the so-called blue ocean event, is what I, what I coined it, then uh, that will happen in a September, no Arctic sea ice, and then within a few years, there's no Arctic sea ice for July, for, for, for August, September, October, and then a few years later for July, August, September, October, November, and uh, then basically Greenland is exposed. It'll be the only sort of center of cold left in the Arctic, so it causes the shifting of the jet streams, and it causes many more extreme weather events but also uh, the melt rates on Greenland go way, way up. There's a lot more calving of ice and sea level therefore rises much more rapidly. And when sea level rises rapidly globally because of the melt and, and loss of Greenland uh, glacier ice, then the sea level rise in Antarctica lifts up the ice shelves, which are, which are also very, very weakened by the huge uh, warming there, the polar warming, uh, both there is, is occurring there as well as in the Arctic. So that lifts up the ice shelves in Antarctica, and then you get more and more calving of those, and uh, you get a vicious feedback effect <coughs> where I expect uh, sea level to rapidly spike upwards once we lose the, the Arctic uh, sea ice. So these things all, you know, we're talking about the overall climate system you know, you can't just, you know, we tend to, when we try to study and analyze uh, things, we tend to try to separate them and, uh, you know, look just at uh, specific individual events. But we really need a systems approach. You know, we need to consider all of the interconnections between the different uh, parts of the climate system. And when one component changes, rapidly it sets into motion a series of cascading events which then causes other things to change very quickly and so on and so on and these reinforcing feedback loops or accelerating feedback loops uh, greatly accelerate the overall rate of, of system change so we're facing terrible consequences from abrupt climate change and uh, you know, more and more people are starting to recognize that. You know, just look at the tremendous, uh, you know, heat waves that are occurring now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's only the, it's the end of June. And uh, we just had the uh, summer solstice, June 20th, June 21st. Um, and uh, already we're, we're getting extreme weather, extreme heat events over widespread areas of of the west part of North America, you know, in the U.S. It's in, and also up in, in Canada, up in B.C. And uh, we're getting extreme heating events and 
uh, worldwide. Anyway, thank you.